Hello, church. If you would open to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, and we will be picking up where we left off last week, which will be verse 12, and we'll read through verse 14. We'll look at these three verses this morning. This is God's Word. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. And so Holy Spirit, who is still at work in the church, open this up for us. As the psalmist says, the unfolding of Your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And we are simple. And we are in need to be changed by You. To be renewed in the power of Your Holy Spirit. And so do it now through Your Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got uh, really two, two aims uh, this morning. I want to talk about two things. Uh, I want to marvel at the providence of God, which is amazingly uh, manifested in this, in this passage. But before that, in this passage, we need to see the problem of pragmatism. The problem of pragmatism. Um, guys, Pragmatism is in the air we breathe in America. This is our default philosophy, whether we realize it or not. You say, what is pragmatism? Simply put, pragmatism is something is true if it works. That's what someone who's a pragmatist believes. Something's true if it works. It's similar to the, the, the concept of the end justifies the means. Um, if something works... Therefore, it's good, even right. It's often connected to postmodernism or relativism where truth doesn't really matter. Uh, someone oftentimes who is uh, pragmatic doesn't really care about truth. Maybe they deny it altogether. Maybe they just don't really care if something is true that's not even in their mind as to how they're operating. Uh, it's all a question of does it work? Um, let, let's be clear for, for a second. Um, there are many ways that you could be pragmatic and it wouldn't be a big deal. For example, this mic I'm using. Right? I don't have to hold one for 45 minutes. That's nice. That's a pragmatic decision. Right? Not right or wrong. Issue of convenience. You know, um, there, there's lots of the, if you're a mechanic and you're using a tool trying to fix a, a drain or something and the tool you thought worked, would work, isn't working and you grab a different tool and it works, that's a pragmatic decision. Not right or wrong. You know, we make these type decisions all the time on non-moral issues. And so we're not talking about that type of pragmatism. We're talking about what's often called a utilitarianism type of pragmatism, that something is best or right or true when it does the most good for the most people. So this is how many have argued throughout history. We could give popular examples like Hitler uh, pragmatically arguing it's right to kill Jews because they, they threaten the future of the superior German race. Or slave traders pr pragmatically arguing uh, Africans can be treated as property because what really matters is profit and free labor. And these are uh, pragmatic decisions that are quite uh, evil. And, and pragmatism's done, I think, a lot more evil than most of us have ever really thought about. Um, What's interesting, most philosophical systems come from Europe. You know, we know that. Um, we can trace most back to, to Europe. Pragmatism, we, we right here on our home ground. Uh, that is a product of the U.S. of A. Um, pioneers in the 19th and 20th century like William James or John Dewey, and that name John Dewey may sound familiar 
uh, to some of us. He is one of the founders of uh, the modern American education system as opposed to classical, modern classical, uh, making a distinction there. So modern American education, 20th century onward, is largely and almost entirely pragmatic. Oh, what, are, what do we mean by that? Um, well, let me, let me juxtapose again to, to a, a classical type of education, which was before the 20th century, uh, would have been built off of a Greek or Roman type of method where truth and beauty have been manifested and revealed and were to search them out, were to embody them wherever they can be found, especially in the liberal arts, so math and science, history, literature, the arts, and to, those things are to be cultivated and used toward virtue and toward the doing of good on the earth. Modern education, on the other hand, is pragmatic. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, learn this concept, learn these uh, answers to this test, so you can pass the test, so you can pass the grade. Because if you pass the grade, you can graduate. And if you graduate, you get to go, uh, you maybe get even a scholarship, and then you can go to a good school, and you can make money. Because if you can make money, then you can play for the rest of your life. It's pragmatic. It's very, 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 very different. And many, um, many Christians are rightly against secular modern education. This is not surprising to, to those of us in this room that many Christians are against secular modern forms of education, but usually what we say is it's because of evolution, it's because of LGBT issues, it's because of all these secular agendas. What's often ignored is that secular modern education prostitutes truth toward the American dream by way of pragmatism. So it's not teaching kids, God has revealed truth, so we are to marvel at it, we're to embody it, we're to believe it, we're to live it out for the good of others, for the glory of God. That's not how we're teaching. But rather, learn this stuff so you can graduate, get a good job, make money, and play. That's pragmatism permeating most of our culture. Most of our culture. Um... And it's obviously made its way into the church. That's why we're talking about it here. Um, anyone who's been in church long, this church long, uh, knows I have a kind of a pet peeve or a soapbox issue. If, you, if I have one, this may be it. It's pragmatism and evangelism. I hate pragmatism and evangelism. Um, churches, many, many Christian leaders aren't asking, what does the Bible tell us to do to share the gospel, to evangelize. That's not the question being asked by many. The question by many is, uh, what works? What works? That's pragmatism. And, and what, what do we even mean by it works? What, what's often meant by that is getting someone to raise a hand, or walk the aisle, or make a profession, or get in the baptismal pool. That is the what works. And so whatever we have to do to get them to raise the hand, walk the aisle, get in the in the baptismal pool, profess uh, a profession of faith. It works, therefore we do it. I had a, um, I ran into this pretty early as a Christian or in, in ministry. This is actually before I was a pastor. The first time I heard this uh, pushback, I was talking to a, a minister who was um, influential in my life at that time. And I was genuinely asking, why, why do we share the gospel this way? Why do we evangelize the way that we're doing it? Where you kind of sit someone and you have them repeat the, the prayer. And I'm like, is there a verse? You know, where, like, where, where is this coming from? Um, and the answer was purely pragmatic. It, it wasn't taking me to a verse. It was, it works. It works. Meaning? The person professes faith, the person walks the aisle, the person says they've received Christ, the person gets baptized, it works. It's very, very concerning, the damage done in evangelism to people's souls because of pragmatism. Um, It also affects worship services, uh, which really goes back to the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 6, we have David and the Ark of the Covenant, You'll remember he put that ark, not where God commanded, but in the house of Uzzah, where it was easiest and most convenient. 
Now, I don't think that's because David hated God. He loved God. Why did he put it in that man's house rather than where it was to be? Pragmatism. It was easy. It was convenient. But it wasn't what God commanded. And that's how many are, are coming at virtually every issue regarding the church. Not a leader or leaders or a church studying the scripture and going, what has God commanded us to do when we gather? Did he tell us to take the supper? Okay, we'll do it. Did he tell us to sing? We'll sing. Did he tell us to preach? We'll preach. Did he tell us to pray? We're going to pray. We're, we're not going to the scriptures and, and seeking those answers. Many are just saying, what would get people to come back who are lost, who wouldn't normally come to church? Whatever it takes to get those people to come back the next week, let's do that. And if they don't like something we're doing, let's not do that. That's pragmatism. And one, you end up making a service about pleasing people. Do whatever it takes to please people. One, you do whatever it takes to please God. By obeying what God has revealed in His Word. And, and those lead to very, very different type churches. Um, it broke my heart the first time I, I came in contact with this kind of thinking as a pastor, this was obviously early on in the church, um, someone came to me and uh, they said, this is a, a person who was there every week, very much a part of the life of, of the body, and um, they were like, we, we love the teaching, we love city groups, we love uh, the people and the accountability, and the, the just, we, we like everything. The thing that just, we're not feeling the worship. You know, like when y'all sing and we it, like it just doesn't I don't feel like I'm worshiping and um and so my response was oh I thought you were going to say something serious <laughs> like God doesn't really care if you feel something when you sing like that's not a big deal I thought like okay we can get right past this you know th there's no verse that says you have to feel something and like like the music, you're, you're commanded to, to sing to the Lord. And, um, but they, they stopped me and they said, no, pastor, we've we got to leave. And, and then they left. Because it was about their emotions. And therefore, everything had to bow down toward that ultimate end. Um, I think maybe most dangerous in the church regarding pragmatism is... is the pragmatism that surrounds community. And I, I probably will say more about this next week because I'm quite sure some, some may uh, misunderstand what I'm saying here and I might need to clarify next week. So feedback if, uh, if that's you. Um, but we, everybody talks of community. I mentioned this even a, a few weeks ago. And amen, community is good, depending on how we define it. Right? As long as it's, if we define community biblically. Um, if we mean by community, people I can care for, people I can shoulder their burdens, people I can love, people I can be generous toward, people I can pray for, people I can, right? That's, that's a biblical community. Biblical community, as Scripture reveals, it is, it is better to give than receive. We're to consider others more significant than ourselves. We're to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. So if we're defining community like that, that's quite good. Unfortunately, what many mean by community uh, is friendships in the way that the culture defines friendships, meaning I don't know if I have enough people that dress like me, talk like me, act like me, have the same hobbies as me, have the kids that are the same ages as me, have the same interests, and we get along and we get to do stuff outside of church settings. That's what community means to many people, which is not biblical Community, and I've coined a technical term for this after 16 years of ministry. Um, I call it high school lunchroom pragmatism. High school lunchroom pragmatism. What, what do we mean? Well, it's because it looks like a high school lunchroom. You know, remember high school lunchroom? You go in, you're not thinking about the food. Even I, I was sometimes thinking about the food, even as a, a, a high school guy. Um, but you're mainly thinking about who am I sitting with? Are my friends here? Do I have any friends here? Can I sit? Who, who can I sit with? And if you're new to the school, you're thinking, is somebody going to welcome me? Is somebody going to talk to me? 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 Is anybody paying attention to me? And I don't want to sit alone here. 
And um, that's how many treat churches. Is anybody going to talk to me? Is anyone going to pay attention to me? Is this is about me here? Are they going to play the stuff so I feel? And guys, we've, we've got to mature past high school, right? As Christians, we've got to get to the point where we say, there's people here that are God's people and I get to love them. Who can I shoulder responsibility for? Who can I care for? Who can I pray for? Who can I give to? And I, there's just, there's, there's, you know, we could get into, we could talk about parenting. Um, I'll, I'll refrain from saying much about parenting, but there are many commands in Scripture that are explicit about parenting. And many times parents just say, but it doesn't work. I know God says that, but it doesn't work. And that's pragmatism. And it doesn't matter if something quote unquote works, it matters that we obey the Lord. And um, I was speaking to a, a man recently, and it was very, it was a very sad, it, it weighed on me for a couple of days after this conversation because this man was talking about taking his family out of Protestantism into uh, the Catholic Church. And um, that's always perplexing to me, um, why, why someone would do that. And so I was genuinely and, and very respectfully trying to just hear him out and understand what was going on leading to this. Is it, is it the Bible? Have you studied a verse? You know, is it, how are you? No, the Bible wasn't a part of it. Um, are you aware of the gospel issues at, at play here? The, the gospel is at stake. Is that, you know, have you, no, I mean, that's not. At the end of the day, at the end of this discussion, it was very clear, this is pragmatism. This is Protestantism hadn't worked for me. I want to try Catholicism. That's, and his family will have to reap the, the fruit of that. Guys, it shouldn't surprise us that even issues like abortion are largely pragmatic. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever heard, I've never heard one time someone say, um, I need to get pregnant because it is righteous to get an abortion. Right? You, it's, not, it's not a virtuous thing that someone tries to get pregnant to then have an abortion because that's a principled, righteous thing to do. What is abortion for? It's pragmatism. It's, I don't want to have a baby with this particular person. I don't have enough money. I'm still in school. I've got a job. I can't, I can't get pregnant. Therefore, in the life. It's an expedient decision. Pragmatically decided. Look at verse 14. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient, pragmatically reasonable that one man should die for the people. So behind... The death of Christ, we have a pragmatic decision. Expedient means practically convenient, but possibly improper or immoral. That's the definition of expedient. Practically convenient, but possibly improper or immoral. We talk about politicians. He changed his position because he, it was practically or politically expedient. And speaking of politics in our day, this is really the real problem with much of politics, right? Almost everything's done because it's expedient, which is terrible because almost every political issue is a moral issue. And so we're pragmatizing our morality, which is never a good idea and always leads to suffering and death, case in point, Caiaphas in this passage. A pragmatic political decision leads to a moral decision to kill Jesus. And John's highlighting it with this word expedient. That's not an accidental word. right? We believe all scriptures God breathed and profitable. The Holy Spirit put that word there. That clearly is showing this was a practical decision. That it's, it's easier, guys. He just stands up. He's the high priest this year. He stands up and goes, guys, what are we doing? 
And, and, and if we'll read later what he actually said, the full context, he, he goes, this is, what are we, you're all not smart. Kill one man, save all these people. This is really easy. Right? It's, it's just practical. It's expedient. And it led to the death of Christ. And the way that, that John records it, listen to the tense here. It was Caiaphas who had, past tense, advised the Jews. Where is that pointing us? Backward. To John 11. And so if you'd flip there uh, to John 11, because we've, we dealt with this in John 11. This is taught in John 11. And, and verse 14 is referring to John 11. It will be in verse 47. Um, by the way, as you're turning there, every commentary I read this week made the connection of this past tense reference that... John is clearly wanting us to go back to chapter 11. Um, he's the only gospel writer who even mentions this interaction in chapter 11. And now John's referring back to it uh, again. So what's happening in John 11 at this council? This is a mixture of Pharisees and Sadducees who didn't normally get along, but at, on this occasion they put their differences aside and they agreed on one thing. Jesus must die. Verse 47, <clears throat> the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs signs, he just raised Lazarus from the dead. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And here it is. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They, want, they knew our temple's at stake here. Here's the irony, 70 AD, they lost their temple anyway. But they know this is coming. They know Jesus could threaten to destroy their whole religious system. Forty years later, that's exactly what happens. And they're deliberating about this. So you've got Pharisees who knew they didn't have the judicial authority to kill Jesus. That's the Pharisees. The Roman Empire, who has all the authority at this time, had delegated and given some of the authority to the Sanhedrin, which is the Sadducees. And so they're working with the Roman authorities, the Sadducees are. So now the Pharisees and the Sadducees get together for one aim. we got to deal with Jesus. And they both agree that he must die or that they will lose what little freedom they still have under Roman law. And so, verse 49, one of the leaders, it's Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, by the way, um, they found his bones uh, in, in 1992. I just found this out this week. Um, it's very documented that this man lived, that he was the high priest, extremely wealthy man at that time. But this man Caiaphas, the high priest, says to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people. And not that the whole nation should perish. So you, please understand, this is not mob violence. This isn't some, you know, a bunch of uh, renegade Jews outside just coming up trying to do something crazy. This is a organized council. It would be like their Supreme Court making a very planned and thought out, practical, expedient decision to kill Jesus. And these decisive words by Caiaphas in verse 50, it is better for you that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. So he's rebuking them and saying, better that one man die than the Romans kill all of us. That's all he's thinking. We don't want to die. Let's let Jesus die for us. Verse 51. He did not say this of his own accord. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. But not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So God brought these words out of Caiaphas' mouth. God did that. So at one level, Caiaphas' words are meaning one thing, kill Jesus. At another level, God's words are meaning one thing, kill Jesus. Either way, it sealed the death of Christ. 
Caiaphas wanted Jesus dead and out of the way, so he spoke these words. God wanted Jesus dead and resurrected and reigning, and so he spoke these words. And, and, and let's be very clear about this. It's not that God hears Caiaphas say this and goes, one man die instead of all the people? That sounds like I could call that the gospel. Like that's a great idea. Not what's happening. God is speaking through Caiaphas. This unconverted man. Caiaphas prophesied and God said, it is better for you that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. God said that. You hear it, church? God said that. And we agree. We agree. Don't we? That's infinitely better. One man died than the whole people perish? Do you hear it? The death of, of Christ was not a tragic event. This is a saving event planned by God. Prophesied through this man for our good. Listen to what one author said. God Himself served the death warrant on His Son. He didn't just predict it. He unleashed it. This word of prophecy tracked Jesus down to Gethsemane and put Him under arrest. There was no escape because God had spoken. Guys, the irony. The awesome providence of God in this. You don't have to turn there, but Acts 4, 27 says, In this city there was gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the, here it is, peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So God's using who? Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel to do whatever God had predestined to take place to Christ. Both Caiaphas and God wanted Jesus to die as a substitute. Let that sink in. A wicked man and God wanted the same thing, but for very different reasons. I mean, and think about how evil the motive of Caiaphas is. He's try he wants him dead. What could be more evil than killing the Son of God? I mean, name something, right? Think of something. Can you think of anything eat more evil than killing the Son of God, who was purely innocent? There is nothing. So these evil men are plotting the death of the author of life and God is plotting the death of His Son simultaneously together but for very different reasons. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. What they meant to bring death, God meant to bring life. You know, this is one of the big questions to Christianity. I'm sure many of you have heard this. There may be somebody here who has this question about Christianity. This is the big one, right? I would put this at the top of the reason skeptics disregard Christianity. Top of the list. The problem of evil and suffering. The problem of evil and suffering. This is almost always brought up when someone... Uh, disregards Christianity or is skeptical toward Christianity is the problem of evil and suffering. How many Christians can open to a passage like the one we're looking at or many others and say, what you're calling a problem isn't a problem, biblically. There's ways to deal with evil and suffering that involve evil and suffering yet it deals with evil and suffering. This is the wisdom of God on full display. A.W. Tozer gives an analogy. Don't cheer out loud because you'll feel embarrassed in a second. Um, he talks about God's sovereignty being like a cruise ship. And so he says, God ordains the destination 
that that cruise ship is going to go, but everything happens on the way is up to us. And now listen, I'm not, I love Tozer. You should read Tozer. He's wrong on that. You say, prove it. Well, the book of Proverbs would disprove his analogy. Uh, what is Proverbs, right? We got Proverbs, it's a lot of practical sayings about how to live wise, right? On all these practical areas of life. Yet all through the Proverbs, we are seeing that every decision on the boat is ordained. Proverbs 16.1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs 16.9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes or ordains or governs his steps. Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs 20, 24, a man's steps are from the Lord. How can man understand his way? Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He, God, turns it wherever he will. This is all normal decisions in our lives. On the boat are divinely ordained, not just the final destination. And it took Job, how many chapters? 42 chapters to realize that? Before he finally concluded, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And God woke him up to reality. God is God. Oh wow, what a revelation. You say, but there's got to be a lot of random stuff happening out there that God isn't controlling. That could be an argument, right? There's, there's got to be randomness. Everything can't be controlled by God. Are you really saying everything is controlled by God? Well, what is Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap. So the dice is cast into the lap. What could be more random than a dice? You can't plan what that's going to land on. but it's every decision is from the Lord. The dice is every decision is from the Lord. My uh, oldest son told me that his, one of his teachers a, a year or so ago was trying to teach them this, and he started every week saying, who wants to read, uh, who, who, should, who does God want to read today in the class? And so he'd roll a dice every, every day to see who would read. Roll the dice, okay, that's who God wants to read. You're going to read. Um, it's a good way to teach this. There's always two stories being written. There's the story we think we're writing about our own life. And then there's the story that God's writing. And those two stories are really one story. What you are doing, God is doing, and His doing is masterful. And I... I've given this illustration and I'll give it again, um, but many have compared this to a tapestry, you know, like a really nice rug, hand-woven rug. On the front of that, you have art, right? Some of the best museums, some of the nicest museums in the world have tapestries, these, these hand-woven rugs hanging up there. But if you flip that thing, flip it over, there's no beautiful art on the other side. Right? There's strings going all over the place. It's chaotic looking. There's no more art to see. And many have compared this to our lives. That's what we see. We see the backside. We look at our own lives and our own decisions and all the things and it's weaving all over the place. It doesn't make sense. It looks chaotic. And one day, God will flip that. One day in glory, He'll flip it and we'll see everything was masterfully designed orchestrated, weaved together perfectly for His glory, for our good, and we'll see it. But we don't see it now. And so it just looks like chaos and randomness and I choose everything that I do and God is no part of this. Uh, Corey Ten Boom didn't think that. Listen to this poem she wrote. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. Oftentimes He weaveth sorrow and I in foolish pride forget He sees the upper and I the underside. 
He's talking about this, this tapestry. Not till the loom is silent, but the, sh- the shuttles cease to fly. Will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why? I cannot choose the colors that he weaveth steadily. The dark threads are as needful as the weaver's skilled, skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver and the patterns he has planned. He knows. He loves. He cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to Him. I really, one of my big hopes for us as a church and as a pastor, what I want for you is to have a bigger view of God where He really is providential over your life. Even the difficult things. And you say, well, what verse... You know, this is a verse I was thinking on this week that I think applies. In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, it says, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking and be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. You need mature thinking. What does mature thinking do? Well, when bad things happen to you, you don't shake your fist at God and say, how dare you? You fall down on your face and you say, He gives and He takes away. Blessed is be the name of the Lord. That's what mature thinking does. It realizes there's a God behind this and it's for good. And we must get this vision. He has a masterful plan. I was uh, talking to a pastor friend this week who's going through some difficulties in his church and I was asking him, you know, how, how do you think the church is processing all of this? Are they seeing it just as spiritual warfare or are they seeing it as God's providence? And he said both, but I think mainly God's providence. And I think that shows the church has some maturity in it. To be able to see even behind the workings of the enemy, God is doing something. And God is working something good. Um, very personal, personably for me this week, there was something on my, on my heart, maybe more than anything else. I was just praying um, about having a... Uh, a more grateful heart and and to really view all of life as a blessing. And so I, I was just asking the Lord to change my heart and give me this. And the thing that popped in my head um, was this, this optimism, pessimism thing, right? Half uh, cup, half empty, cup, half full. And I was thinking about that. And then the Lord brought to my mind what the psalmist said. What did the psalmist say about the cup? My cup overflows. And I'm like, oh God, please help me to not see the glass half empty or half full, but always overflowing. How do you always see your cup overflowing? Well, it says right after that, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of, the, uh, all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've got, to, we've got to see God doing good to us, even when it doesn't seem that way. And I think we have to start by seeing God doing good to His Son, even when He was bringing about the death of His Son through the evil plots of Caiaphas. And so let me ask this. Who is responsible for killing Jesus? Who does the blame go to? Because people try to figure this out, right? Is it the Jewish council and Annas who's responsible for killing Jesus? We'll get there next week. Was it Pilate and the Roman authorities responsible for killing Jesus? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Was it Judas who betrayed him, handed him over? Yes. Was it Satan who put it in Judas's heart to do it? Yes. Was it the Old Testament prophets that prophesied about the Messiah's saving death? Yes. Was it Caiaphas' prophecy that brought the death warrant upon Jesus? Yes. But even more than even our own sin, which is absolutely true, and the Bible says so, the death of Jesus occurred because the Father in the Trinitarian councils before time, gave the cup to His Son. This was God's doing. This was God's doing. 
And we are very happy about it. It's not a random death, church. It's very specific. Look at verse 51 and we'll end here. He prophesied, I'm still in chapter 11. He prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. That's the nation of the Jews. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So Jesus' death doesn't merely provide an opportunity for people to be saved. Oh, there is an opportunity, please hear me. Right now there's an opportunity to believe on Christ. But God's death in His Son is not merely an opportunity. Please, pay attention to what this says. It is a security. It is a guarantee. Verse 51 says, Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. That's a guaranteed salvation for the children of God scattered abroad. Jesus didn't die for nobody. He died for somebody. Jesus' death was actual, not potential. His death was specific, not general. Do you see it in the text? This is a real death for real sinners. Jesus died for, keyword, the nation. And not for the nation only, but for His people who are scattered abroad. That's substitutionary language. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It was for somebody. Not just anybody. Not just everybody. For the children of God scattered abroad. Anyone who would receive Him. Guys, missionaries stay on the field because of verses like this. They go to the field because of verses like this and then they stay there because of verses like this. There's a flock of God predestined before the foundation of the world and He died that that flock of God make it to glory for the flock of God scattered abroad. There, uh, the irony here is awesome. Let's marvel at it as we go to the table. At the council, the irony in the high priest Caiaphas' pragmatic, murderous words to stop Jesus was actually a gospel proclamation. And the irony at the cross, what was meant for evil, God worked for good. Amen? Let's, let's go to the table. Let's prepare our hearts to rejoice in this. Father, Lord, only You could devise a plan where You would take evil and sin, malicious, willful, voluntary, hateful, and somehow out of that evil, you would work the most good anyone could ever possibly conceive. Lord, how could we ever doubt that even in the little trials of our lives, you could not work them for good? Help us to trust you in these little things because in this massive event, you demonstrated your providential working. Lord, we, we pray for our own hearts as we go to the table that we could think great thoughts about Your Son. Remember His death and what it accomplished to forgive us of our sins. We praise You. We thank You. And we pray all of these things in the name of Your Son. Amen.